My name is Bartram Kelly. In this month of November 1977, I'm completing my 36th year of working at Bell Helicopter Textron and its predecessors. Three years ago, I retired, and since then have been acting as a consultant. Recently, among other things, I found an opportunity to compile a motion picture, which I would like to narrate for you. The title of the film is The Birth of the Bell Helicopter. But first, a few words about Arthur M. Young, the inventor of the Bell Helicopter. A native of Philadelphia, Young was born in 1905. He studied mathematics at Princeton, where he graduated in 1927. He felt a very strong urge to invent something radically new and spent some time casting about for a field of activity. By December of 1928, he had finally decided to devote the next 15 years of his life to inventing and creating a helicopter. Arthur Young's initial method was to spend a week or so in various cities, such as Philadelphia, Washington, Detroit, and New York. He would check into a hotel room and spend his days in public libraries, looking up all the entries he could find under the word helicopter. In this way, he became well-versed in the patent literature and the history of early helicopter research. He found that a helicopter had succeeded in hovering for a few minutes in Ohio in 1923, and he read accounts of the experiments of many pioneers in the field. His next step was to set up a small aeronautical laboratory in the barn of his family's home in Radnor, near Philadelphia. In 1929, if you announced that you were working on a helicopter, you were considered eccentric, to say the least. And if you were a young man of independent financial means, as Arthur Young was, it took lots of courage and persistence to devote your full energies to what was thought of as a crazy invention. But persist he did. From the start, he developed a habit of taking movie films of all of his experiments. After he joined Bell in November of 1941, fortunately, he continued this habit. And as a result, there are hundreds of feet of film of uh, excellent scenes of the uh, development and research that led to the production of the Bell helicopter. After this production started, uh, Arthur Young gradually withdrew from the company in the late 1940s in order to devote full time to what he considered his life's work. This, in his own words, is a synthesis of science and fundamental philosophy. Recently, he has published two books which partially explain this uh, work of his. The first one, The Geometry of Meaning, and the second one, The Reflexive Universe. But now back to those cans of movie film in the archives of Bell Aerospace Textron in Buffalo, New York. The first part of the film you're about to see is mainly cut from scenes from a film which Arthur Young himself made before joining Bell. It was for the purpose of explaining and promoting his ideas, especially the concept of the hovering stability of a helicopter. But the very first scene you will see was taken by me in 1931, when I interrupted my studies at Harvard to act as a sort of laboratory assistant to my friend Arthur. This first scene will show a 10-foot diameter model with propellers at the tips of the blades. The propellers are driven by a centrally located reactionless gear driven by an electric motor. The reactionless gear was the subject of Arthur's first patent. Now this flight is typical hovering instability. The next scene is about nine years later in 1940 in Arthur's barn in Paoli, Pennsylvania. Uh, hovering stability tests. 
Uh, these scenes are taken from the movie entitled Principles of Stability. Those are independently hinged blades, but nevertheless, in spite of those hinges, the rotor follows the mast perfectly. Now, there were authorities at that time who thought that that would not be the case. In fact, it was even in printed reports. But uh, Arthur quickly proved what is now obvious, that even the hinges will not uh, prevent the rotor from uh, following the shaft very rapidly. This is typical of the model testing that he did. It's a coaxial design. The loader, rotor of, on the bottom, which you see flickering, is merely to take the torque out. And that is a pair of balsa blades, uh, whereas the upper rotor is the lifting rotor. The torque between the two is equal, but since the upper one turns faster, it has most of the power. Arthur had to learn mass production of uh, these little model blades. In fact, he taught a neighboring farm boy how to make them so that he could quickly rebuild and make the flights again. Now, there's the stabilizer bar, and uh, this is December of 1939 when he hit upon the idea of the bar. Notice how the rotor no longer is attached to the mast so rigidly uh, that it lags behind when he rocks the model in that cradle. There, uh, immediately you see that, of course, it flies perfectly stably. In, that's inside his barn. He's even unable to upset it by jiggling it that way. And so he can make free flights outdoors. Now, this model has no control, and so it's being blown by the wind. That's the reason it moves toward the left. The only control, of course, is to the uh, voltage to the motor. 110 volt motor to which he uh, applies a 210 volt line with a rheostat. The fuselage legs seem to be spinning there simply due to residual friction in the gear. Here he's replaced the bar with a flywheel. The flywheel turns at the same speed as the motor and the rotor is turning 1 13th the speed. Now notice when he rocks the cradle that the rotor hardly follows at all. In fact, when he le leaves the cradle over to the side, the rotor takes an extremely long time to uh, uh, take on the same angle. Now, this flywheel allowed Arthur to make a remote control model because now he could simply tilt the flywheel by some external means and make the helicopter fly in the desired direction. He added that white paper tail there just to reduce the fuselage spinning due to friction in the transmission. Uh, his next idea was to make a remote-controlled model and to use it as a demonstration to promote uh, the uh, idea of a project to make full-scale helicopters. Now, uh, he, uh, with this model, managed to measure rate of climb. He got up as high as 200 feet in the air with it, but, uh, of course, had to wait for extremely calm weather to do so. There's a nice jump takeoff. You can always see those veins on the bottom, but the lifting rotor, of course, when it's turning fast, it becomes invisible. So uh, at about this time, he decided to make a really nice uh, remotely controlled model, and here it is. He's going to demonstrate it for us. We'll see him take the cowling off now and uh, show the anatomy. The black thing just above the cowling is the swash plate. And you can also see that harness, which is holding it above its center of gravity. Now there's the motor in the bottom and the uh, rotor on top, the flywheel again turning at motor speed and the rotor 1 13th. You can also see the swash plate under there, the black Bakelite object. Now this is a single rotor tail rotor configuration and the tail rotor is driven by the uh, separate motor in the nose, that little blue motor there. It, in turn, has its voltage controlled by the uh, uh, flywheel you see there, so that if the model changes direction, the uh, flywheel will precess and change the voltage. Those are the solenoids uh, which control the black swash plate, and there's the harness above the center of gravity. The cable 
has nine conductors which uh, uh, control the various uh, solenoids and of course the power of the motors. Notice his hand moving laterally, the pl uh, flywheel moves fore and aft. But once things are spinning, then the rotor will follow exactly what his hand does due to the gyroscopic effect, of course. As his hand moves left and right, the rotor will tilt left and right. And now uh, we see that there's quite a breeze here. That's the reason for the smoke. And he is, in fact, able to control the model without having to wait for flat, calm days and uh, can uh, fly it where he wants to send it. With this model, uh, he went to Buffalo to show it to Larry Bell, whom he had met through a mutual friend. And Larry Bell was instantly fascinated, not only with the model, but with Arthur Young. Uh, by the way, notice those, uh, that landing gear. It's very important because uh, you're going to see a lot of it later. But here's the little wheel landing gear which was used for the fancy demonstrations in the Bell factory and in many other places. <coughs> so uh, Larry Bell and Arthur got together on an agreement and uh, Arthur went to Buffalo in 1941. It was November 1941. I went along with him to uh, help carry the luggage and be his assistant. Uh, after the arrival in Buffalo in November 1941, six months later, we got a separate project started in the village of Gardenville, New York, in, an, in a, what had been a garage. And here we are illustrating the design part of the project. There's our first transmission drawing. And then, more important, we had an excellent shop right there where we could uh, make the actual parts for the helicopter. For instance, here's our assembly of the first uh, machine. That tail boom was made in a nearby Bell plant. Here is a landing gear very similar to the landing gear that we had on that model which you saw. Now here we're removing the shaft from the tail boom. Uh, and we had just been running it up to see if it was okay and the bearings would work and so forth. That pulley to the left there was used to drive it up to full speed and make sure we had no resonance. There's a pretty good view of the garage as a whole and the first uh, test bed really taking shape. There's the mechanism that the first machine had. It's stabilizer bar and of course above it the hub ready to accept the blades. The blades were very similar, by the way, to the model blades. Now, we used very few drawings when we came to things like the fuselage, which was mostly plywood beams, and uh, we improvised as we went along, of course. Naturally, we had to have drawings for control parts and transmission and so forth, but uh, for instruments and uh, things we considered uh, uh, unimportant, for tolerance purposes, we simply improvised as we went along. Now here's the same boy who had learned how to make the model blades in mass production, uh, making full-scale blades to almost exactly the same design. They're solid wood. That cam causes the saw to uh, follow, make an airfoil shape. Uh, the leading edge has a metal insert, as the model blades had had. We made two different airfoil sections before we were through, the 0012 and also a 23012, which was not as easy to uh, uh, smooth out as 0012. 